This video series is going to be about the history and development of the standard model. Some of what I say will be true, but a lot of it will be apocryphal stories that I've picked up over the years that I'm now going to share to you because I think they're helpful in learning the order of events and how things came to be. As most physics stories start, this one starts in ancient Greece with the philosophers who started by trying to decide what matter was. And they broke matter down into four types. There was solid matter, there was liquid matter, there was gaseous matter, and then there was matter associated with energy, with heat. And that's the way that the ancient Greeks understood the universe. But obviously some matter is more valuable than others. And so during the 15th, 16th, 17th, even as late as the 18th century, there were alchemists trying to turn matter from one type into another. They were trying to make gold, and they were in search of some mythical device called the Philosopher's Stone that they could use to make gold. Now, by this point, it was well known that you can combine some different types of matter to form all new types of matter. And some matter could be broken down into other types of matter. But actually, what that matter was was a bit of a mystery. And it was a man called Mendeleev who came along and started systematizing it. What Mendeleev did is try to break down matter to as small a part as you could get, the most fundamental constituents of matter, and then arrange it in a table by properties. This table evolved to what we now know as the periodic table of the elements. The periodic table of the elements is a triumph. You can use it to make predictions about properties, but you can also use it to make predictions about how different elements, as they were now called, could combine to form compounds. And the entire subject of chemistry hinges on the periodic table and Mendeleev's discovery. But for physicists, that's a bit too complicated. We like the universe as simple as possible. And there are just too many elements. 92 elements going all the way up to uranium is just far too many for a physicist to cope with. Now, the work of J.J. Thompson and Ernest Rutherford gave rise to a much simpler model of matter, where matter consisted of a positively charged nucleus surrounded by negatively charged electrons. And Ernest Rutherford went on to say that that positively charged nucleus could be broken down into smaller subatomic particles. The discovery of the electron by J.J. Thompson was the first subatomic particle to be discovered and isolated and for its properties to be determined. So now physicists had a much more simple universe consisting of just protons and electrons. And we were very happy with that. But there were some problems with that model. For example, the nuclear mass sometimes seemed a little bit too big. And as you go up the periodic table and look at the nucleus, the mass seemed to go up much more than the charge did. So Ernest Rutherford theorised another particle within the nucleus, a neutron, some sort of particle within the nucleus that increased its mass. And the neutron was discovered in 1932. So that meant there were now three elements that made up the universe, three constituents of matter. They were the proton, the neutron, and the electron, which is still much easier to handle than the 92 elements Mendeleev gave us. The picture still wasn't complete, though. There were some strange things that were observed. Electrons could come from the nucleus of the atom, and when they em were emitted from the nucleus of the atom, they had a range of kinetic energies. And there was no real way of explaining that. Uh, so Wolfgang Pauli theorised that there was another particle that was emitted in beta radiation, which had no charge and very, very little mass, if any, called the neutrino. Neutrinos were later discovered, so now the universe consisted of four particles, still much less than the 92 that Mendeleev gave us. But there was a bigger mystery, which was why the nucleus stayed together at all. If the nucleus contained positively charged protons, and neutrally charged, uncharged neutrons, then why was it able to stay together? Surely those positively charged particles would repel each other and the nucleus would blow apart. Now Coulomb's law tells us about the force between positively charged particles. 
Here you can see a graph showing what Coulomb's law predicts for the force between positively charged particles. It's a repulsive force. And you can see on the range here, we're in the order of micrometers at the moment, which is far bigger than an atom. In micrometers, you don't really notice that force between two protons until you get a bit smaller, and then that force increases. Now, this force over here on the y-axis is not very big at all. That notation there is saying 2.00 times 10 to the power of negative 14 newtons. Not a very noticeable force at all. But then this is a much greater range than the size of the nucleus. This graph shows how the force between two protons varies as a function of the distance between those protons. But if we look a little bit closer in the nanometer scale, this force starts becoming more significant. Just remember how small those protons are and how little mass they have. If we go even smaller to the picometer scale, you start seeing these forces in millinewtons. This is 10 millinewtons. This is 15 millinewtons. These are more significant forces for particles with as little mass as they have. If we go to the scale of femtometers, which is the scale size of the nucleus, then we start getting orders of 10,000 newton force on these tiny subatomic particles, a repulsive force. This nucleus should not hold together. To put that into comparison, I weigh about 1,000 newtons, a bit less than 1,000 newtons. So for the force between two protons to be in the order of 10,000 newtons, that is a significant repulsive force. And this was known about, which meant there was a big puzzle here about why the nucleus held together. And we're going to try and unpick that puzzle in the next video.